So, uh, welcome all the diehards who are up early this morning. Uh, when I got the first slot, I thought, okay, well, we'll see how many people actually show up. So, hopefully the topic is of interest. Um, the, the topic, leading change, and what we're going to talk about today could really be considered an XOR for all of the things that I've tried in my career that haven't worked. So, we're, we're going to focus on things that are successful in leading change in, in security. And, um, the approach here is to lead change in an organization without having or using positional authority. So the goal of our conversation is to talk about how we actually bring change uh, about in organizations without having you know, some big heavy hammer from somebody up to food chain. Uh, this kind of ties into what we were talking about yesterday in the keynote address about uh, you know, um, our role as security practitioners is to help. Not to look at people and say, you guys are a bunch of idiots, but to try to help them uh, learn more about security and learn more about how to be secure in what they do. And uh, so we'll jump in. I call this the double three plus one. There's kind of a three aspects to the change paradigm, and then there are four aspects to patterns. Anyone who's familiar with agile development knows the term patterns. The, the book that this is based on, the framework in the book, is uh, called Fearless Change. And I highly recommend this book. It's a great book. It talks about, first, the paradigm of change and the areas where we would have success um, in change. And then it has a series of patterns, about 24, 25 different patterns that can be used. Just like when we write code, we have patterns that are best practice implementations. We're going to ta tackle the first four patterns, the four most basic and most important patterns in leading change. So Fearless Change is the book. The authors are Mary Lynn Manns and Linda Rising, and the book was published by um, Pearson Education in 2005. I'll give you a chance to write that down because I see a lot of people writing. We've got y'all do an email already. So, um, and I would uh, encourage you to ask questions or share if you've had experience with what we're talking about. Um, share your experience throughout the presentation. I'm a very informal presenter and perfectly happy to see a hand raised and a question asked. With that, we'll jump in. So the change paradigm, there's three aspects of the change paradigm. The first one is a change agent. There needs to be someone who wants to enact change. A lot of times there'll be a kind of a corporate uh, directive, you know, you go and make everyone do complex passwords. That's not a change agent. That's just someone that's been told to do something. A change agent is someone who's passionate about what they're doing. They have a they, they believe that the change they're trying to enact is going to make a positive difference, and they're really passionate about it. Then, also, it requires some skills, and we'll talk in a moment about those skills, but also there's just this drive, this innate drive of, if I, if I uh, work on this change, and if we make this change in our organization, it's going to make us more successful in what we do. So, that change for us as security professionals can be anything from introducing a secure development lifecycle and bringing some of the processes, tools, and skills into the development side of what we do, um, all the way over to uh, improving the way we communicate with our clients about the security uh, that we're putting into the application and the security that we expect them to maintain. So the skills that it takes here are um, soft skills. They're, they're people skills. Most of us are, have an engineering background, and we think a lot about the hard skills. You know, uh, and we interact and relate a lot better with ones and zeros than we do with people. But if you want to bring change about, you need to develop these skills. Uh, working well with others, we tend to at times be kind of lone wolves. Uh, but what's interesting is, you know, we can get together and build these conferences together, and uh, we work in a group well when it's the topic we're familiar with and we're comfortable with. The idea is to kind of extend that and say, okay, how can I work with someone from, say, marketing? in my organization and help get their help and get their involvement. Uh, appreciating people is uh, underused but very, very powerful approach. Uh, showing, we don't, especially in engineering, we don't often, we're not touching feeling, we don't often show appreciation to people for how they help us and what they've done. But this is like the grease that makes everything work. Being able to, you know, put your arm around someone and say thanks a lot, I really appreciate it, uh, makes a big difference to them. And it doesn't have to be a big thing. Uh, there are a couple of different ways that people are motivated or that they feel appreciated. One of them is money. 
and it can be as little as just giving someone a, a $5 gift card. Uh, my boss, Tab Pierce, is here today, and he knows, you know, there are a couple of times where we've done, yes, you are, for a couple more days. Thank you. So, Tab is the owner of Caliber Security Partners. And I work for Tab, and I'm kind of moving off on my own here. Um, and Tab knows that, you know, when I'm in the middle of a big project and there's a lot of deadlines and I'm really stressed out, he can send me a, an Amazon gift card that was like really motivated. So I'm one of those people who's motivated by money. Others are motivated by public recognition. As simple as printing a little, you know, certificate out of Word and gathering the group together and handing them a, a certificate and saying, thanks for your help. That's, a, that's enough for them. So, uh, appreciate people. And they're kind of a good communicator. That's really a challenge for a lot of us in the engineering uh, side of things. We, we talk great with our computers and with each other, but we don't communicate well with the people who we struggle to speak at a non-technical level, for instance. Um, if that's something that you struggle with, I highly recommend that you find a public speaking course. There's the Toastmasters organization that you can go to and learn how to speak better with people. Dale Carnegie Institute offers a course that I took many years ago and really, really enjoyed. If you want to improve your communication skills, try some of those. Um, and then the other two things that really, really make a big difference are persistence and patience. Change takes a long time. And here's my first XOR. Um, I was director of security at a company, and uh, there were just a thousand things that we needed to change, and I was very impatient uh, with those changes. And eventually threw my arms up and just said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to another company. This is ridiculous. Um, patience and persistence and sticking to the change is what, what brings that change about. So just stick with it and be patient. Um, I want to take a minute to talk about the change agent. And I think if, if you think through all of the people throughout time who, who kind of caused change to happen, Gandhi, uh, to me, is a very good illustration of successful change. Um, he had a very uh, low uh, class upbringing. He was you know, born into a merchant class and father in a small uh, store. Um, from that, somehow, everything worked together for him. He was able to go to England and study law. Um, and then, uh, really, this one man changed the world for what's now 1.25 billion people. And he did it relatively peacefully. And he started small. He just enacted change in a small village he lived in in South Africa. And that eventually spread to change throughout all of India and really the British Empire. Um, and the thing about him was he was pacifist, meaning he didn't try to use positional authority to enact change. He had personal authority. People respected him, respected what he said, and respected his dedication. Um, but he also was very patient and very, very persistent. If you have, have the opportunity to read his uh, biography or autobiography, you'd be amazed at how persistent this guy is. So um, he's a great example of a change agent. And if you take that and put it into your organization, if there's a change you want to enact, one thing you can start with is just become the expert in the area you want to enact change. If it's secure development, learn everything you can about secure development. If it's, uh, you know, we want WAFs, I want to put WAFs in front of our web application servers. Learn all about the WAF. Become a, a known expert in that field so you'll, you'll develop that respect that that you have. Okay? So the other, another aspect of change that's really important is the culture of your organization. And there are certain cultures where change is more difficult than others, but it's possible in every culture. It's just a matter of how long it takes. In order to have a culture of change, you need quite a few things. Um, the, the foundation is a nurturing environment. So that's an environment that's open to change, is the idea of bringing change in. You also need the flexibility to experiment and fail, and we'll talk about that shortly a little bit more. But having some support from your manager and, and having the ability to try new things is it's critical to that. And then finally, we need helpers. Change doesn't happen with us alone. We may have a little bit of an idea, and that's a good spark, but we need some tinder to help that spark grow into a good thing. So if you don't have these things, it's just going to take longer for it to get done. And, but there are some organizations where it just fails overall. And that's a good sign of an unhealthy organization. So keep an eye out for that. Questions so far? Is that, is that clear, or is that early? All right, so failure. Um, the, one of the concepts of Agile is the idea of failing fast. 
Right? The faster we can fail, the faster we can find out that our product is a bad idea, the less time and money we waste on it. So failure is really, um, a, it's a freeing thing. It gives us the freedom to explore, gives us the freedom to experiment and succeed in uncharted territory. There are a lot of organizations that kind of say, well, this is how we've done it all along. This is how we're going to do it. We're not going to try anything new. And those are the organizations that are disappearing. Um, I used to work for one. I, I uh, <laughs> left a 12-year career at Microsoft to go to work for Circuit City. I don't know if anyone remembers that company. That was a big mistake. That was a company where, it's funny, they were written up in good to great. You know, they were like the model company for how to do things. When I got there, they were not the model company for how to do things. Because new ideas weren't welcome in an organization like that. And that's the kind of thing that's kind of a death knell. So, failure is a great opportunity to learn. And it's, the thing is that, you know, there's a hundred things we might want to try as an organization to build software better or to deliver our services to our clients better. And it's great to try those hundred things because somewhere in there, there's one or two things that are unique. That if they work, they'll set us apart from our competitors. And the only way you can discover those is to try and fail. So the concept here is fail, fail fast, um, and, uh, and, and get moving uh, on to the things that really work for us. The last aspect of the change paradigm are the people. So um, the, the kind of people that we want to work with, and this is nothing new, pretty famous pie chart though, of the, uh, the type of people involved in change. Okay, so you have a very, very small sliver of innovators. Those are the visionaries. They're the, what, how, did, how did the Apple ad say? They're the fools, the foolish ones, right? Those are the guys that are, they, they show up every week with a new device. And, you know, the, they, they, they're the ones that spend, what is it, $10,000 on an Apple Watch, right? Um, that's a good group to be involved in if you want to bring change. If you can convince some of them to get involved, they'll help uh, market that change for you internally. Next group, of course, are the early adopters. And those are your best people because they're going to pick up what you're doing. They're a larger chunk. And then, of course, it goes from there. And there's always, in the very end, there's always laggards. There's always people who resist that change to the bitter end. And uh, even those people have some value because once they accept your idea, you know that it's going to survive. So being aware of that type of people is really, really important because it allows you to know who to reach out to at what point in your change process you find yourself. Um, you know, if you're very, very early, then you want to go look for the innovators. You, you literally look around for the people who are, if they're developers, you know, are they the ones that are running the latest bleeding edge of new development frameworks? And they're the ones that are trying to get those frameworks accepted and used in the organization, even though they're not even built yet. Um, they're great people to start with and get on your, on your team. You want to spend a lot of time with early adopters and with the early majority, because that's where you're going to get your real momentum and change. So um, how, do you, how do you find these people? You just observe. You just have to look and ask yourself you know, who they are and what they're doing and, and just try to figure out what group they fall into. There's some other kinds of people that you want to involve in your change process. Mavens are information specialists. These are people who just know everything. And if you can get, and they have a lot of respect because of their knowledge, if you can convince a maven to work with you on a project, or if you can just convince the maven to advertise your project for you, you'll have a lot of success because you almost have another um, evangelist for your idea once you find a maven. Salespeople are good. Um, I think maybe the worst just came out of my mouth. Salespeople are helpful. <laughs> in, in, in this case, I don't mean people that are necessarily on the sales team. There are people who just very naturally adopt ideas. And when they adopt an idea, the first thing they want to do is share that idea with others. So that's the phrase, sales salesperson. And those are the kind of people that you want to have uh, working for you at a certain phase in your project. They're the convincers. Once the project has panned out, it's shown some success, you've got maidens uh, supporting you and stuff, the salespeople are the ones that can spread it around the organization. And, uh, you know, how do you find them? They're the ones that spread gossip. They're the ones that talk about, you know, all the latest things that have happened in the company. Um, I, I know a guy uh, I worked with at Microsoft who was a, a salesperson that he was connected with every single group. He knew all of the dirt from every group in the company. He knew what GM was going to get fired next month and how he got all this information, I don't know. But that was the salesperson you wanted to bring in your idea to. 
And then finally, the connectors. He was also a connector. He just knows people everywhere across the company. And that's the next thing you want to find, especially if you're working in a very large organization. Um, one of the challenges I had trying to lead change at Microsoft was I just didn't know enough people. And had I known then to look for connectors, I would have built this good network. It, it's funny, even to this day, um, people use LinkedIn at Microsoft to find each other. Right? When you're in a company of 90,000 people, you've got to have tools to figure out who's who. And, and LinkedIn is a great tool for that. And you find connectors to something like that. So if you're in a smaller company, it's a little bit easier to, to identify the connectors. They're just the people that are bouncing from group to group to group. And they have friends all over the company. They're great to go to and just ask, hey, who can I talk to you about this idea? And they'll give you great ideas and they'll give the right direction. Okay, so those are the people. So that's your paradigm. Um, one other thing to talk about people. Okay, there are three kinds of people in this world. Those who make things happen. Those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. I apologize for the low reviews that you're getting. You need to find the right people at the phase you're in in the project. And you need to embrace this truth. <coughs> and there, you don't spend time early in your project trying to convince a lagger to help you. Move on and accept the fact that they may be your best friend, but they're just not going to step up and help you with it. Uh, and then also be kind to them, to the slow adopters. They may be slow, but once they adopt, you know that your idea is really there and it's going to stick. So that goes back again to the patience, right? A lot of times we're just like, this is so obvious. Why can't you pick up on this? Well, that's fine to have that idea in your head. Just there's some, It's okay to think some things, but don't express them, at least to the people that you're upset. Um, so last, last kind of note on people and last note on the paradigm. So... To kind of summarize that, you, you have this paradigm that you need to keep in mind when you're trying to enact your change, because you've got to pick the right people. You need to either be in an environment that naturally nurtures change, or you need to, to work with your manager to get permission to try to. Um, and the whole idea there around change is, let's fail fast. Try something small, we'll see if it works. If it doesn't, then that's fine. We learn something and move on. We haven't invested a lot of time in that. Right? So now we're going to talk about patterns, and I really am hoping that there'll be some interaction here with us because we're moving quickly through the slides and it's the time as well. So um, I, we're going to talk about four patterns that are kind of the basic introductory patterns to change. In the book Leading Change, or I'm sorry, in the book Fearless Change, there are about uh, I think 25 or 26 patterns for change. But these are kind of the first four. And we'll start with the, the, the test the water thing. And you'll see this pattern is very, very similar to a pattern for agile development. So there's kind of a goal here. In this case, if you have a new idea and you just wonder, is this idea, would this idea work well um, in my organization, in what I do day to day? Right? That may be, um, you know, we've been building applications in .NET and Java. It takes us quite a long time to build them. There's this new thing, Rails. Um, Rails seems to accelerate development. I wonder if that's a good fit. Uh, okay. So the first thing is testing the waters. The idea really is you're dipping your toe in the water just to see how well it's going to be accepted. You're not making a wholehearted, complete organizational shift. Okay, today we write in Java, tomorrow we're all going to write in Rails. We just want to try it out a little bit. So small things feed to the action. Move slow, be prepared for disappointment. Not a lot of, not all of our ideas will take, even if they're good ideas, they won't necessarily take in the culture. Um, and then, like I keep saying, fail fast. The idea here is to fail quickly. What are some of the things that you can do to test the waters? Well, you know, just start talking to people. Ask people, hey, I, I read about this new thing, um, what do you think about it? And, you know, be an expert, so be able to explain it. Have have an elevator pitch so you can explain it very quickly, but also have all the details you need behind it so you can answer questions. Uh, another one is to just just do it and give a demo. So you know we're working on this new implementation of this application, and what I'm going to do is take a couple hours some evening and do a prototype and take one or two features out of the application we're building and then time how long it takes to build it in this new platform. And then I'm going to give a demo to my manager and just say, hey, we might want to consider this for a future project that seems to accelerate it. Uh, and then brown bag. So uh, one of the patterns in the book is bring food. Uh, and, you know, having a brown bag, you're not necessarily bringing the food, but 
everybody's got to eat, you might as well have an engaging conversation instead of sitting in front of a computer doing thumbs on the keyboard. Uh, and then, you know, a couple of other things here you can do is take, take those conversations and, and kind of ask your boss for time in a meeting. It's funny. Have you ever seen a meeting go 43 minutes long? If it's scheduled for an hour, how long does it take? <laughs> well, yeah, an hour, ten minutes. Meetings will expand and contract to fit the time you give it. So if you talk to your boss and say, you know what, I'd like, I'd like the last 15 minutes of the meeting to do this, he, he or she can usually squish the meeting down to 45 minutes and you have those 15 minutes. You need an opportunity to, to talk about what it is you want to do and get people's feedback. Um, so, you know, that's a great way to get a bunch of people together. You, they're already in a room, they're already together, and they are going to have a lot of opinions. So it's a great way to you know, test a lot of opinions. And then, you know, the last one is to kind of see, I have a little story to, to tell you that will illustrate that. Um, I grew up in up, upstate New York. Um, a lot of people think when I say New York, they think of big buildings and cities and stuff. I grew up on 250 acres of land, uh, and my nearest neighbor was a quarter mile away. And my little sister was really smart. Um, one day, she was I don't know, in the kitchen with my mom. I think they were washing dishes after dinner. And she said, Mommy, when you were a little girl, did you ever want a, a pony? And my mom said, oh, yes, I did. And, you know, and there's a family story about her. She had a, you know, one of those stick horses stick ponies called Dobbs. And so, so they talked about dogs, and, and, and this is my eight-year-old sister. She was really, really smart. And that was it. She dropped it. So then a few days later, um, she came up to my mom and said, Mommy, don't we have enough land to keep a horse? And my mom said, yeah, yeah we do, because we had all the land. Right? So we really do. And that was it. So she dropped it. So then... Um, Eventually, she said, Mommy, we, we really need to get a horse. And at that point, my mom was totally convinced as well. So then, when it came time for dinner, and they sat down at dinner, and my dad was there, um, my little sister said, hey, Daddy, I really want a horse. And my dad, who's a smart man, looked to my mom to say no. And instead, what did she say? <laughs> she said, yes. That's how you plant the seed. And you're patient. And that turned into like 25 years of my mom being involved in pony club, and my little sister rode rode horses all the way through college. So she was really smart. She got a lot further than I ever did in my idea of a mini bag. So planting the seed really, really effective. Plant the seed and walk away from it. It, it is rough. It really is. Questions on the test of waters? Does anyone have an example of something that's worked for them in this kind of concept? No change, huh? All right, we'll move on to the next pattern. Time for reflection. Um, because, you know, in the IT world, we're known for how much time we have. Okay? Uh, so the idea of time for reflection is we're an evangelist, dedicated champion, we're using t test the waters to try to influence and make change to happen. Um, and uh, we, you know, so we're doing all these different things to bring change about, but we know if it's working or not. The core idea is to just stop and think about, okay, what's what's going well and what's not going well. And ponder over those things. And it not, may not necessarily be about the idea. It may be about how we're approaching the change for the idea. Right? So maybe we held a brown bag, and at the brown bag, we did a little demo, and the demo fell, completely fell apart. Okay? That's something to reflect on and say, okay, this could have been done different. I'm going to go home, I'm going to practice this demo four or five times, I'm going to make sure it's just, it's rock solid, and then I'm going to try the demo again. Um, okay. It's important that we stop and really think about this. I know when I was trying to enact change in a couple of the organizations I worked in, I was so busy, go, 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 this idea didn't work, I'm going to try this idea, I'm going to try this idea, I'm going to try this idea, and really what it was, if I had stepped back and considered the paradigm of change, I wasn't using the paradigm. All of the ideas that I tried to enact change, they were probably all very good ideas and would have been effective had I used the paradigm. So a lot of times, our reflection, we're going to be thinking more about our style. And for engineers, I don't know about all, all y'all, but for me, 
stopping and thinking about the soft skills is frustrating. Right? I'm like, look, this is just this is as plain as the nose of my face. Like this just makes sense. Why are people adopting this? But we have to stop and think about that, and we have to think about the soft skills that we are using or not using in order to be effective change agents in our own movement. You catch your failures by reflection. And at some point, reflection may indicate, hey, you know what, the idea, the overall idea that I'm using is wrong. Um, nine times out of ten, it probably is. If it's taken on somewhere else, it'll probably take it in the organization. It really comes down to how effectively am I using the change paradigm, and how effectively am I implementing the change patterns. Okay. Another thing to do is to reflect as a group. So we use retrospectives in Agile, right? We sit down, we plan out our releases, we do a sprint, a couple of sprints, a release, and then we have a, a, a retrospective where we, we talk about how do things go. Early on in migrating to Agile, retrospectives are really important because we, we start to learn about our estimation uh, accuracy. Right? So the whole goal of Agile is I work 40 hours and I go home. That's really, for me, that's what the goal of Agile is. Uh, and so the first couple of sprints, we inevitably take on too much work. And the problem is, if you're really agile, if you took that work on, you're committed to doing it, even if you have to spend all day Saturday in the office to get it done. So it's sort of this really great negative feedback loop where, like, I'm never going to do that again. Let's talk about the way we, we estimate. That's the retrospective. Same thing, if you're trying to lead change and you have a group of, maybe you've got a maven or two and a connector and a couple of early adopters who are trying to push this change out of the organization, Always good to step back and say, all right, I've been reflecting internally on my own, but what about as a group? Can we talk about things as a group and figure it out? Um, and then ask, you know, um, what, why, how, why not, and what if? I had a great manager. Um, I used to work uh, for the LDS Church in the IT department um, where I actually tried to introduce secure development. And it's funny because I've spent several months talking about, we've got to do this, we need to do this, we need to do this, it's got nowhere. Um, and then when we were doing a new release of a new product um, that had a lot of privacy you know, repercussions, I actually just said, hey, you know what? Let's just sit down for a day and talk about security in the morning, and then maybe we'll take an afternoon and do some security uh, activity. And boy, that took off, and it just went great. It was, it was really good. I, my manager at the time, he had a rule of five whys. And when we were in one-on-ones and other conversations, he would ask why, and I would give him an answer, and he'd ask, okay, but why? And I, we, we would pair each answer apart, going down five whys. So if you're looking at change, and it's not going well for you, and you want to have a retrospective, either with yourself or with a group, try to five whys. Okay? Well, I tried to implement um, the idea of threat modeling, and it failed. Why did it fail? Uh, well, um, people didn't, uh, people wouldn't let me have a threat model. Well, why wouldn't they let you have a threat model? Well, they thought it took time away from the organization building software. Well, why did they think it would take time away from the organization building software when in fact it would speed up the overall development process? Oh, maybe they're not educated what threat models mean and how they work. So why don't I take a ground bag on and not do a threat model, but talk about a threat model, maybe do a sample threat model, and show them how down the road it saves us all this time. Okay, so rule five why when it comes to reflections. Great, great approach. Small successes is in the next pattern. Um, look, change in a lot of IT organizations is, is a challenge. Um, we work in in some cases we work in very bureaucratic organizations that are very, very resistant to change. And um, honestly, like, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of like a mouse. I need a piece of cheese every now and again. And uh, small successes, the idea here is just celebrate whatever you can celebrate. Uh, the, the very little things are helpful. So um, the pattern, the, the background of the pattern is your evangelist, you can find patterns to change, some of them work, some of them haven't. And, um, you have to keep in mind that you're going to have good days and bad days. And the bad days seem to accentuate themselves quite effectively. We, we know when we've had a bad day. We, we know when we've had a failure. It's the good things that are a little bit more difficult to recognize. Um, I have a good friend who uh, works as director of security at Rally Software. And he's been trying, he's the first director of security in the organization. And they're 
they're, they've been kind of resistant to change. And he was really frustrated by it, as with his previous job, um, until he said, you know, am I more secure today than I was yesterday? And if so, let's celebrate that. And it's the incremental little steps that you take. Celebrating success may seem kind of silly, but you know what? Just getting a group together and going out for a, for a, you know, whatever you want, a sparkling water or a beer or whatever, and just kind of celebrating, hey, you know what? We did our first threat model ever. Let's, let's have a little party and celebrate it. It's a great idea. So recognize those little successes, especially the small ones and the early ones. Long change can take forever. So the idea is we have this goal that's way, way out there, but let's make sure that we're focusing on what we're doing day to day um, and step by step, which we'll get to in a second. And, you know, the celebrations don't have to be big. They can be, sometimes a celebration is just peeling away from work for half an hour, hanging around and, and shooting the breeze. We used to do, um, in one group I worked in at Microsoft, we did Beer Friday, so we did Beer Friday. Uh, and we would go down to the store and we'd buy junk food and we would buy uh, tabloids. And from 3 to about 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, we'd just sit around and we'd talk about the project and we'd also read silly stories out of the tabloids and, you know, just have a good time uh, just catching up and talking. Instead of having the pressure of, you know, I'm a developer, I'm a program manager, trying to get this stuff done, we're, you know, at odds and all that stuff. We would kind of just step back and we do it successfully. The early victories are really important, even if they're small, because they, they're a feedback loop. Right? If I have this idea, I throw it out there, and lo and behold, I get a couple of early victories, I know I'm on the right track. And that gives me the energy to stay dedicated and committed to what I'm doing going forward and, and stick to it. So, celebrate the great things. Okay? So, um, so, the last pattern here is step by step. The, the idea here is you realize now that there's actually interest in your idea. And the, the important thing is to, so you want to know um, how to introduce, you, you've got some early feedback that it's good, what do I do now to go forward? Okay, and the idea is to use that incremental approach I was just talking about, where you, you've got this vision out here, and that's fine, that's where you want to be, but focus on the next step. Don't get focused out there, uh, because that'll take care of itself. So it's funny, uh, I, I mountain bike a lot, and I had the opportunity to bike with a professional um, racer who's winning the race left and right. It's a very interesting story, actually, all by Burge, because we have plenty of time. Uh, she had mono and had to cancel one of her seasons. She came back the next season and won her first race, and then she got hit by a car and broke her pelvis, and they said they didn't think she'd walk again. And uh, the last I saw on Facebook last night, she's wearing the yellow jersey in Vietnam. There's an international mountain bike race in Vietnam, and she's doing the race. So she's the kind of person that really sticks to it, right? And she taught us when we were riding, she's like, look, you can't look at the bottom of the hill. The bottom will come, and you can't look right in front of your tire. If you look about 15 to 20 feet ahead of your bike, your peripheral vision will pick up everything up to that point. And you'll have enough warning that when you're going to hit a rock, you need to hop over or something like that. And change is kind of the same idea. You, you have an idea of where you're going, and that's coming at you no matter what. So, and then you've got the things you're doing day to day, right? But you just want to know your next step. It's the next one or two steps into the darkness, if you will, that you need to focus on. And every once in a while, when you do your pause for reflection, you can make sure, okay, am I still on the right path, or are these things that are going to take us the wrong way? And if we're going the, the wrong way, is it actually the right way? Is the feedback we're getting redirecting us, or are we getting off the track? So it's the small steps. Um, so it's the same idea as climbing a ladder, right? We do it one rung at a time, and we just keep going up and up and up. Uh, so the other thing to keep in mind is that a plan changes, right? Was, was it Pat who said, you know, battle plans are great, and they're, uh, but they get thrown out the window the moment the engagement begins. So. Um, and the, the idea here is also with the step-by-step -step thing, look for the things that you can do quickly, the little wins that you can have that will gain confidence for you, for the team that's trying to enact a change, but more importantly for the organization that's taking a risk on your change and the time that it's going to divert you from your normal daily okay. Any questions? Those are the four patterns. Any questions or comments on the patterns so far? 
So we're on to our last slide. We've got about 20 minutes left, so actually we're right on time. So some of the lessons learned from the trenches. This is kind of the rest of my XOR. Um, people and companies are are better with change when it's incremental. It's the frog in the water approach, right? If you stick a frog in a pot of water and turn the heat on, the frog will stay there and boil. If you drop a frog in boiling water, they'll jump out of it. So bring your change in slowly. I have a, a, a former manager who had a fantastic mindset. I was very enthusiastic about my job. I wanted to come in and just change the world in this organization where I was. And she would always refocus me and say, John, you can't boil the ocean. You've got to pick one or two things to focus on and focus on those, and then you move to the next one. Incremental change. Long term vision, best kept yourself. Um, you, you, you should give a general idea of the direction you're going, but the last thing you want to do is walk into the office. And, you know, I do a lot of work in secure development, so that's why I keep using that as an example. The last thing you want to do is to walk into the VP of engineering's office and say, a year from now, your developers will, will all write code, and before they check their code in, they're going to run it through static code analysis. And we're also going to have unit tests that cover both um, use cases as well as abuse cases in security. What VP in the world would hear that and be comfortable? None of them, because that means a complete upheaval of how they do their work. What you can do is walk in and say, you know what, I've got a goal. And the goal is that a year from now, we're going to be writing significantly more secure code. We've got a number of ideas to work on it. I'd like to talk to you about the first thing I want to try. We want to get some static code analysis tools and start running our code through that just to see where our, our vulnerabilities are and what kinds of things we might want to see from developers. That has value. And that didn't ask for a year-long commitment. That asked for, oh, okay, I'm going to spend some money and I'm going to spend a little bit of time, but it's not going to interrupt what I'm doing with my uh, okay, So long-term vision, keep it to yourself. Gazelle-like intensity. So my wife is fantastic about finding And she's a big fan of uh, Dave uh, Ramsey. Yeah. And he talks about gazelle-like intensity, right? What's the idea of gazelle-like intensity? Well, if I'm a gazelle and there's a lion chasing me, I'm very, very involved in that moment. And I'm super intensely focused on escaping with my life. Um, and gazelle like intensity from the day to day goals and the patterns and the paradigm is what will yield results. It's funny, I, I've always or had historically approached change from an ad hoc perspective. I, I'm a visionary and my wife can't stand it. She's like, you know, today I'm like, oh, we, we should totally redo the backyard this way. And then tomorrow I'm off thinking about the garage. You know, the backyard is done. Um, the idea is to, uh, you know, be that visionary, but also uh, pick one thing and work on it, and then pick the next thing and work on it, and the next thing. So be organized in your approach. Um, and then change is best accepted when it's couched in self-interested terms. And the self-interested terms change depending on who you talk to. Right? So if you're talking to a CIO, they really don't care too much about, um, you know, new things. Okay, we're going to do this and your developers are going to know how to write code that's free of signal injection vulnerabilities. Great, I'm excited about that. What I really care about is getting my product out the door on time. So with the CIO, we talk about change in terms of, well, you know, if we can work to teach the development team how to write code that's free of signal injection vulnerabilities, that's going to help you because, number one, your code is going to pass the security review the first time instead of getting kicked back. And number two, when it goes out the door, it's not going to have to come back. When you talk to the CFO, they love return on investment. And they love risk reward, right? So I can go to a CIO and I can say, look, we've got X number of uh, PHI records in our database. If we were to breach every single one of those records, that would cost us $312 a record times however many we have. So we're looking at a $3 million risk. And, you know, I think one of the ways we can significantly reduce that risk is if we were to invest in blah, 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 and it's going to cost this much money, and they'll say, oh, okay, so you want $30,000 to help mitigate the $3 million risk. That's not a great return on investment. 
And then uh, CEO, we talk about filling the board expectations, right? More and more our boards are, are holding their CEOs accountable for security. And so it's a great opportunity to say, look, I know the board is looking for this, let's figure out how we can do it in our organization. And then finally, we the engineers, because engineers are about learning new things and about getting things done more, more quickly in most cases. And so we speak their language to them. An engineer really doesn't care about the return on investment of a lab. They just care to know, oh, if it's the lab in place, that means I may not have to may not scatter it with the vulnerability. So speak in the language of self-interest. And think about your, your audience and what they may need. So in the end, really, the whole idea here about change is it, it's, it's a conscious thing. There's, there's a paradigm. There's some patterns to put in place. The real key is to recognize, oh, I want change to occur in my organization. First recognition. Second one, there are ways to do it successfully. Let's stop and think about them. What's my paradigm? Who are the people that are going to help me with my change? How am I going to do it? What are the patterns I want to apply? And then really very consciously go through the process and you'd be amazed at how much more effective you are at bringing change into your organization. And to bring this all back to what we do in this room, we have a, a, a finally, I guess, is one way to look at it, there's a culture of conversation in our country today about security and privacy. We have the opportunity and the responsibility as security leaders, and even if we aren't managers, we are security leaders because we are the thought leaders for security in the organization. We have the opportunity now to push that change in our organization. We, just, we need the right skills, we need the right tools, and the right tools to get it done. And this is one very effective approach to take. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions people may have or comments that they have, and we'll, we'll be done. Questions? Yeah, so Uh, in security, pain is the number one reason to change, right? I mean, look at look at Target. Look at all the people that breach. What do they do after they breach? They turn around and they fix it. Yeah, wait. How many? Oh, I just heard ten. Okay, we did. Okay. All right. They yeah. That's fine. So yeah, it's pain is a key uh, change. Now, it's very reactive. And I think everyone in this room would agree that right now, security and security change is an incredibly reactive industry. In other words, we don't do anything until it's broken. The real key here is to be able to drive risk conversations in your organization based on the pain that other people have experienced. And say, okay, you know, Anthem breached recently, and look how much this is going to cost them. Take the couple hundred thousand records, multiply by Portland's figure, $312. That's a lot of money. Are we prepared? And so the best thing is to try to use other people's pain. And that goes back to the idea, long-term vision is best kept yourself. So if you say, boss man, we are going to implement all new Cisco firewalls. We're going to rewrite. And we're going to take our flat network and segment it. We're going to put Atlas between networks. And, and this is going to be fantastic. What is your boss think? Too much work, downtime, people are going to complain. So there's, there's a better way to approach it, smaller incremental way to approach it. So I'll give you a, a, um, an indirect farmer's answer to that question. Um, I had a, a, a friend who knew a man who did uh, was passionate about genealogy. In the course of his lifetime, he discovered you know the records of 125,000 of his ancestors. That's a lot of people. Uh, and so my friend asked him, "How did you do this?" And the guy's mantra was, "Great, do as little as you can every day without doing nothing." So if you're working with a client whose who's default approach right now is do nothing, you know, we can sit down and I don't know, there's, I, I mean, a potential, a lead, there isn't a lead in the world that I've spoken to who has not said, I would like to be more secure. But they'll all say, I'm constrained by what? 
money, time, and resources, people, right? So, so we say, look, it would be great if we had a complete secure development life cycle in this organization. You're constrained by money, time, and people. What's one step we could take to be more secure? Is it, is it a day-long training on, on OWASP top 10 defenses in .NET? Okay, well then let's do that training. Um, you know, is it, uh, we'd love to buy all the Cisco firewalls, we can't afford that. Okay, well, have you done a review of your apples? And just talk about that. So the little things, just pick a little thing, and you know what happens is sometimes those little things will snowball. And you have those successes, the little successes that lead to more and more sales because they trust you. And they know when I engage with this person, I become more secure day after day after day. And when the, when the wallet does open up, they don't come back. Okay, all right. Okay, we've got time for a couple more questions or comments. What's that? Yeah, uh, this, everything will, <coughs> excuse me, everything will be available on video, but also, um, if you want to just email me, it's john at infosecure.io, and I'd be glad to share the slides. Other questions, comments? Hey, it's been a great audience. They wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't last a little bit, so. Thanks very much.